from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today and for moving down closer to the front. We really appreciate it and are happy to enjoy you and see if you're really, really excited or if you maybe make it easier to throw tomatoes at us. I don't know. Um, I hope everybody's having a good DPLA fest so far. We are here. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we are here to talk to you today and give you an update on library ebook platforms. Uh, as some of you may remember from last year, we were able to do a really intensive ebook workshop thanks to uh, generous funding from the Sloan Foundation. And a lot of good work came out of that. Um, I think most importantly, I got hired, so hold your applause. <laughs> um, and so we wanted, I wanted to give you at least a quick update on where we are and then introduce my colleagues who will talk more of the, uh, the, the state of ebooks and libraries more broadly. So where are we now a year after DPLA Fest 2015? Uh, I've got a couple of our projects that DPLA has been working on up there. Uh, open eBooks has been mentioned, I know, quite a few times today, and we're going to talk about it even more as we go through, and I'm sure that Mike is probably going to talk about that as well. I'll just mention briefly what DPLA's role has been in open eBooks as a partner. We put together a curation core of some of the nation's top school librarians or librarians working with youth and they curated the 6,000 books that we have available in open ebooks. They were able to take those publisher donations and pick out what it is that students really want as well as reflect the diversity. Um, we also run the social media for it. We help convene the community conversations around it. We're helping to lead conversations around accessibility in ebooks and try to improve even more some of that native functionality that comes through EPUB and working with Readium. And we really see that all of the press that's been around open ebooks is an opportunity to help further some of these initiatives in the ebook community. And DPLA is helping to lead that conversation along with our partners, NYPL and First Book. Also, I have up there a little graphic for LEAP, the Library E-Content Access Project, which was funded by IMLS. And DPLA's role in that is to be the, again, the community convener. We're trying to figure out what our role is in ebooks, again, as, as we've worked in the past year, and so we're helping to organize the conversations that going, are going to go around creating a library-owned marketplace, which, again, Mike is going to talk to a bit more later. Um, with that idea, though, and, and DPLA organizing these community conversations, we're also working on a sort of a broader ebook working group, a broader ebook community, and this came out of the conversations last year. So how can we create an umbrella for everybody who's working in ebooks to come together and share all of their information, share what they're working on. We want to be able to streamline the efforts. If somebody in Massachusetts is working with a publisher and somebody in Texas is working with a publisher, how can we make sure that they're connecting with each other and talking about what uh, inroads they were able to make with content? We had some great discussions over the last week um, for those of us who were able to join at the Public Library Association, as well as some of us um, you know, got together yesterday as elite partners and are really trying to um, see where we all fit in there. And I think that those conversations are going really well. Um, I also have a little graphic down there. DPLA has about two million items that are categorized as books within our, um, within our site and we're looking at how we can open up that content. And there's gonna be a whole session uh, right after this talking about how we can try to open up the content that our hubs have and turn those into accessible eBooks. So I'll just quickly add, um, going back to what I said about the eBook working group, we want voices to get involved. We want people to feel that they have a community that they can come into and talk about eBooks, learn more, be connected with the resources that they need for their library. So, <laughs> We have uh, up here on the screen a couple of different places where you can look to get involved. So there's, we're still sort of figuring out what our best options are going to be. Um, we've got a Google Plus community, a working group listserv, and a wiki page that posts uh, every, our findings, our, our final products. I would recommend going again to the dp.la website, get involved, eBooks. We're really um, bubble, trying to get this to bubble up and making it easier for you all to connect. Um, 
So please just get in touch with me if you know that you want to be involved. This is something, that, uh, a conversation that you want to be part of, and I can make sure that you are plugged in. And I'm Michelle. Um, you can find me on the DPLA website. Our emails are pretty easy. Um, so with that, I'll introduce my colleagues who are here to give you an update from their world of eBooks. We have Christine Peterson, who is the Amigos eShelf Manager for Amigos Library Services in Texas. Greg Pronovitz, oh, you guys switched sweet thoughts on me. <laughs> Greg Pronovitz on the end there, who is the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Library System. And Micah May, who is the Director of Business Development for the New York Public Library. And with that, I'll pass it over to Christine. Thanks for coming. Um, I am Chris Peterson. I'm the pro project manager, program manager for the Amigo Seashell project. But fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not here to talk to you about our project. Talk to me afterwards, okay? No laughter, no nothing. <laughs> okay, so my role today is actually not to talk to you about us, but to, talk, to give you a little bit of history, to give you um, the library created platforms that went before us and where they are right now. But the first, I want to give you the three reasons that libraries started doing this. And it really goes down to Douglas County, which I will talk about a little bit more in detail. There were three reasons that Douglas County decided to create their own instead of continue with the commercial vendors. The first was the loss of ownership of the titles that they were subscribing to at the time. Also, the increased price. Um, there was a specific incidence with Overdrive that really turned the corner for them. And the third was the requirement of their patrons having to learn yet another user interface. And with all three of those things, um, they decided we can do this. And so I'm going to start with Douglas County, who's our first. Douglas County decided to integrate their ebooks into their ILS, the one you're looking at right here. But let me, I have about a minute per, per here, so I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. They were the first ones that said, you know, we can do this. And they went to IMLS, and IMLS was, they were fortunate enough to get an IMLS grant to help fund this, this change. They did decide to do what we all claim we want to do, which is try to bring everything together instead of having silos, so that they were able to bring everything together within their ILS. Of course, they had, um, they had technical resources to be able to back that up. So the question is, where are they right now? Oh, by the way, yes, everything they did was open source. If you go to the Evoke, Evoke, E-V-O-K-E -E website, you will get everything you need to know to do this for yourself. Uh, I do want to tell you that where they are right now is kind of questionable. Actually, it's probably um, not really questionable. They are not moving forward. There have been a number of staffing changes at Douglas County. Um, particularly in the administrative um, area, and their, their, their focus has been moved to something else. Now, I say that telling you that they still have a server, an Adobe content server, sitting there, and it is still working. They have not yet turned it off, but they are not moving forward with it. I also want to make a, a m mention here that when they created this, they created it without web-based ordering. You'll talk, I'll bring, come back to that, explain why that's important. Right after that, well, Within a year after that, Marmot, which is a, a consortium that includes Douglas County, it's a multi-type library consortium in Colorado, they decided to move forward on this. Um, and they created their own. Now, they're a consortium, so they were not just dealing with a single library at this point. They decided to use ViewFind, which is an open source discovery system, as their, their interface. So they, didn't, they already had an existing ILS, but they used ViewFind as that discovery piece. So that when they added the eBooks, they were also doing the same thing as Douglas County. They were just doing it the, the different way. Douglas County used their ILS. Marmot used their ViewFind interface. So they already had um, a very robust ILS that was going. They went ahead and in included eBooks. Um, they also integrated eBooks with other resources. They are not just dealing with OverDrive. They deal with multiple eBook aggregators, and they bring all of that into one. They do an incredible job there. They also uh, upgraded the ViewFind functionality so much that it forked. So now you have ViewFind Plus, and you have the ViewFind community versions. Uh, they also have decided not to move forward with the ebook side of this, with the, um, with the platform side, mainly because uh, they are changing their focus and into other types of, of functionality. Now, the interesting thing is their Adobe content server sits at Douglas County. They share that server. So as long as Douglas County's server is up, 
Marmot is still up, but they're just not doing anything with the service. Um, there, I don't believe, last time I heard there was not a time frame for Douglas County to take that server down, but I would imagine in the next year it might be down. Marmot is right now starting to move those ebooks that they purchased onto other commercial platforms that they have access to. Taking a little bit out of, um, out of um, uh, I was trying to do from old, oldest to newest, but I want to continue with Colorado. This is probably one of the newer projects. This is the Evoke 2.0 project. And the reason Colorado did this was because of the lack of web-based ordering, which made it really difficult for the smaller libraries to be able to join. Too much, too much time, too much, they didn't have the resources to do it. So they went back to IMLS and got a grant to actually create an end-to-end -end solution, which included not only web-based ordering, but also included a really nice interface. Um, it was a complement to the projects that had already been going on in Colorado. And um, they did do this. Uh, they they um, got a, an agreement with Odillo, and Odillo went ahead and changed their software to do this. Um, unfortunately, it was never implemented. So it sits in Colorado, and right now it sits at the Colorado State Library. Um, to this point, nothing has been done with it. That doesn't mean that something won't be, but right now it's been a, a year, maybe a little bit more, that the software hasn't been used. So we don't know where this one is going. We'll see. They may, they may, I know that there's a lot of interest at the Colorado State Library to do something with it and to be part of the ebook um, work that's being done. The next group that came forward was, sorry, was Khalifa. Sorry about that. Uh, Khalifa is a consortium out of California. It's a public library consortium. And they, just, they, they are the third. So we have Douglas County, we have Marmot, and then we had Khalifa. And all of these people I'm talking about, you know, those of us who came after stand on the shoulders of these people. I mean, they did incredible work. They did incredible uh, time, experience, uh, money that went into this. So even though I'm telling you that some of these projects have, have stopped, that doesn't mean that we don't still value the work that they did. And that continues with Khalifa. So they um, are a consortium. There are multiple ILSs there that they, they work through and with. They use the ViewFind interface that Marmot has created. They also started out with a single shared collection, and now they have moved to um, not only a single shared collection, but also collections for each library. You might notice that I have a note up there that the Kansas State Library is part of Khalifa, and so those of you who are in the know know that there was an issue between Khalifa, I mean, sorry, Kansas State Library and Overdrive, when Overdrive upped their cost by 700%. The result of that was K Kansas pulled their books out, and they are now a Khalifa member. So there was a, there was an interesting um, story behind that. So where is Khalifa right now? Khalifa is oh, moving forward. My gosh, yes. You don't you don't want to get in, you don't want to get in front of Khalifa because they're going to run you over. So there's a lot going on, and there's Paula right there. You know, there's right there. So Khalifa is moving forward. Now the key right here, you might notice that there's no web-based ordering. And I say that there's no web-based ordering yet because Khalifa is looking into ways to bring that in. And again, if you have that, it makes it easier for libraries to be able to use the service. So then I move on to ours, and I wish I could spend an hour here, but I won't. I'll spend just a couple minutes. Um, we were next. We were, probably, we were the fourth ones, and because we stand on the shoulders of everybody else, what did we include? We included web-based ordering, so this is just a, a real quick view of that. We are a multi-type consortium. We span, historically, we, we span um, six states. Uh, when we decided to do this, we decided that choice was our Flexibility and choice is what we're looking for. So when libraries come to us, they choose uh, where they want these ebooks to show up. They, uh, we have interlibrary loan agreements with almost all the publishers. We're looking at multiple licensing agreements. I mean, there's a lot of things that we're doing, mainly because we're straddling both public and academic school and special. So where are we headed? Um, we are, can I say, right behind Khalifa or right with Khalifa? I mean, yeah, we're, we're moving forward as well. The next one is the Montana State Library. I did not even know they were doing anything. I, I'm so embarrassed um, until about six or seven months ago, but Montana, and the reason I didn't know is because Montana was doing it internally, 
and it took them a long time to do it. Um, there's a, there were a lot of technical challenges. They didn't have a lot of staff. They didn't have a lot of money, but they wanted to see if they could do it. So they did a pilot project, and their authentication came just through SIP. They didn't do any other auth authentication. They are dealing primarily with um, eBooks that are um, about Montana or written by Montana authors. Um, there's nothing really happening with it right now. It is up and running. They have, they have 30 titles, which tells you it's a pilot. They are looking to, to broaden that or possibly to become part of LEAP or to look at Khalifa or Amigos, but they are, they are looking to see how they can become part of this conversation, um, whether it is to, to keep what they've got or to, or to, to hook on to some, somebody else. Um, the next one I have is uh, Pennsylvania. There are two libraries, Oil City and Meadville Public Libraries, which are about 30 miles apart in Pennsylvania. They, uh, Meadville has a tradition of doing, using open source. They were one of the first Koha libraries, and they do a lot of open source there, and they give back to the community. And they looked at this one, and they said, we can do this. We're going to do it as a pilot. And their hope was that the Pennsylvania State Library would look at it and take it on. That was the hope. Uh, you might notice that it says, ready to test with libraries. They originally gave themselves six months to do it. 16 months later, they're starting to test. Let me just say it takes a little bit longer than, than you think. So this was built as a proof of concept. And uh, they have two publishers. They've brought in Gutenberg, and they brought in Abdo. So they are also up and running. Um, We'll see, where, we'll see where they go. The last one that I have here is um, Connecticut. And although Connecticut's not a platform, Connecticut is important because they were given $2 million to build a platform or possibly to support a platform. So there's a really good story behind this I don't have time to give you, but LJ has an excellent story about how this all worked, and you would all smile at how the state process works. Um, but they are now looking, and they are um, intimately involved in the LEAP project, so we'll probably see them come out with something. The last big thing um, I do want to mention is the National eBook Platform, and that's kind of LEAP. Sorry, that's kind of what LEAP is. I just want to say here um, that this is, that we, don't, we are not sure what this is yet. This is a, still a continuing discussion of what this might be, but the idea is it might be nice to have a single place run by libraries or run by a nonprofit that could bring down costs, it could, um, it could uh, reflect the values that we have when it comes to licensing and how we deal with eBooks. So we're looking forward to seeing where this one goes. And I want to I want to end this just by saying that those of you who are as old as I do, and we and you remember going from um, manual card catalogs to computers, and those who remember internet coming, and you remember CDs going out. This is another transition we're in, and as frustrating as it, as it is, it is an exciting time to be part of this. So I want I just want to leave you with that. Um, all of us who work in this ebook space, and we hope that you guys will join us. We're all very excited about what's coming. There's a lot of different projects out there, and they're doing a lot of different things and who knows where it's going to end up, but it's a great time to be involved. And with that, I'll let, let's see, is it your turn? It's all yours. Thanks, Christine. Can you hear me in the back there? Okay. I can't really see you, so. Um, I'm Greg Pronovitz, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Library System. And I'm here to talk about a survey that uh, I distributed, but it was developed in collaboration with Michelle from DPLA, Valerie Horton from Minitex, and Veranda Pitchford from Rails, where we're gearing up to do a, a presentation at ALA Orlando. And this is sort of the preliminary look at our survey results. Um, I presented um, results of an earlier survey at a Minitex webinar uh, last year, and if anyone's interested in seeing that, my email address is up here. I'd be happy to send you the link for that. Oops. Um, so, first of all, we had 35 respondents to the survey, and I only have 10 minutes to talk about them today, so it won't be comprehensive. But if you have a consortial ebook platform or program that you would like to be included in future surveys, please get in touch with me and we'll get you a survey. Um, in our survey of the 35 respondents, four of them had either national or multi-state reach. Four of, and uh, 
20 of them were statewide programs of one way, shape, or form, and 11 of them were regional programs. This map, I decided to put in a political statement. What I see here is both conventions become contested. Trump and Bernie switch sides, and here's what we get. <laughs> um, but really this is, um, the red states are statewide ebook projects that are not overdrive. The blue states are statewide ebook projects that are overdrive. And statewide is taken very loosely, 90% availability. Uh, the black states, I don't believe, have statewide projects or did not respond to my surveys. Um, Missouri and Virginia both have multiple statewide projects. Here's what the 2014 survey and the 2015 survey look like. Uh, the, the one on the right is the, is the newer one with more red, and I added one blue in Ohio that I learned about. Of these consortia, some of them gave enough demographics that I could talk about their primary uh, focus, either public, academic, or multi-type. None of them were primarily K-12 or primarily special. The participating libraries were chiefly K through 12 with well over 2,500, public with about 2,500, uh, academic in the 500 range. This is a total aggregate, not, uh, not any one. Total number of libraries participating is over 5,700. The tiny number of 13 special or other libraries often included a state library. The population served reported by those who reported population served totaled 58 million uh, population. So these consortial ebook projects really have a lot of reach. I did a little uh, scattergram of uh, when these projects began, and of those reported, you can see they're really bunched up around 2011 through 2013. There were a lot started. Uh, in one started this year, so congratulations. We asked uh, our colleagues about publisher agreements, and three of the projects talked about having more than 100 publisher agreements each, Amigos, Enki, and uh, TechShare. And those libraries and others that were interested in it uh, all felt that the trend w of working directly with publishers was on the rise. We asked folks about which aggregators they're using. Overdrive was the big one. And this survey certainly didn't include every single Overdrive consortium out there by any stretch of the imagination. So the local Overdrive users um, will probably grow way beyond this once we get a, a wider reach with the survey. Um, EBSCO came in second in this case. Um, Net Library was mentioned specifically in a couple of cases. Uh, Baker and Taylor next. Biblioboard, Bibliotheca or 3M, and EBL and Total Books all came in with two. And then there were six others that were just a sprinkling of this, that, and the other thing. We asked, you, we asked respondents about licensing uniqueness, and this was their own opinion about what was unique about things. And uh, one of the things that we noticed in our own program in Massachusetts, we have a, a Baker and Taylor uh, agreement with statewide uh, access, and we found that Baker and Taylor really helped us open the door to some big five publishers that weren't available when we started. Um, unlimited use of recorded books and biblia board were other uh, interesting features. We asked folks about what kind of unique content they had, and they listed languages, early literacy, and some local content. Other data. Of the, of the groups that reported, 
About 900,000 total unique titles are available among them. Uh, I don't have the number of how many actually reported, but it certainly wasn't 35. Um, and of the ones that reported annual spending, it totaled $10 million. And that, again, was just a small percentage of respondents. Not everybody did that. We need to get a better handle on that, too. Uh, the funding formulas that these groups use to gather contributions from either state funding, grant funding, local funding, uh, really varied. There's no, uh, no way to really report a trend in that at this point. So I wanted to talk about some of the conclusions from the comments that people made uh, during this. And one of the common themes in what was your vision for your project, and that the, the theme common throughout all of that was expanding access to more content for more patrons. Um, the challenges that people were, were dealing with were uh, meeting holds, the cost to meet the holds demand, uh, collection development and weeding to stay fresh, and expanding content to new lending models and genres. The opportunities that I see um, as a result of this survey and the work that we've been doing in Massachusetts and the former, the past DPLA Fest, and many discussions that have gone on, on over the past few years are, are really embodied in uh, the IMLS grants that are out there now to support uh, a national digital platform. Simply E that went to New York Public Library and a large number of partners. The LEAP grant that I'm sure Micah will talk about in detail that we're a partner on and many of you are partners on. And the Simply E for Consortia, which was granted to Minitex with a large number of partners to develop an app for Consortia to provide much enhanced discovery, uh, checkout, and uh, ease of reading, simplicity. So I think our opportunity now is to really take advantage of the economies of scale of the, of the few that reported $10 million in spending. It's got to be double or triple that from what I'm guessing. And if we can put our uh, buying power together, put our, com our technical development power together, that we can really go places with discoverability and simplicity. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Greg and Christine. I feel like that's a perfect setup for what's next for me. And uh, I have the luxury of talking mostly about the specific problems that I've been, the specific projects I've been working on. Um, and I guess before I dive into that, I guess uh, let me thank uh, these folks and very personally, because I think what Christine said about building and standing on the shoulders of the projects from before us is absolutely true. And it's, it's very much true of these projects that I've helped to conceive and drive. And I think specifically Greg and Christine are two of those shoulders. So I met most of the partners and found out their work on ebooks because of a call that Christine was convening amongst people doing ebook work. And so very literally, I found the other people doing this work through her. Um, and similarly, Greg has been a constant voice and advocate for the need to do this in a big scaled way that has, I think, uh, been one of the most powerful voices saying um, we're approaching this right. Um, so I think that as we think about what's next in this space, um, in my mind, it is time for a transition. And I think the projects that Christine uh, gave a really nice history of uh, were groundbreaking and they were powerful and they proved that we can do it. And I think that was a really important thing for libraries to go do and prove. Uh, but I think they also proved something else, which is that they demonstrated that this is work that just screams for scale. Once you build these capacities, you should share them because it's very easy to reuse them and to share them. And so I think that we are benefiting from the lessons learned from those projects in that uh, the projects that I'm going to talk about have been conceived in a way that bakes scale in from the very beginning. And I said this at PLA last week, and I'm going to start saying it every time I talk about this. I think we are talking precisely about building components of a national digital platform for libraries. This is precisely that. And we're starting with ebooks, and I think this will show that we have the capacity 
uh, to build capabilities that can very quickly expand beyond ebooks. And I would say even this year, we're likely to be able to handle things like audio. And it will very quickly be clear that this is not about ebooks. This is about delivering library content to patrons on library owned infrastructure. So this is, in my mind, a first foray into building the national digital platform for libraries. And I think that's how we should conceive of it. So I want to give another shout out um, as I start this to readers first. I think the work that our projects have done would not have been possible without the tremendously successful advocacy work of readers first to open up uh, ebook content and provide interoperability between those platforms so that you can serve it in a library owned environment. So uh, uh, Michael Blackwell, who's in the fourth row here, you want to give a wave, has uh, I think been one of many leaders that have stepped up and are really helping to rejuvenate and uh, double down on Readers First and the promise of interoperability uh, that it offers. And I think that both Greg and Christine hit on something very powerful which is the idea that our, you know, while we are small institutions in some cases, even NYPL compared to, you know, the, the Goliaths of the technology world that we sometimes hold ourselves up against, collectively we can be very powerful. And I think readers first showed that when, you know, really just a small percentage of these distributors' clients started saying, you know, this is our content and we should own it. And we want the ability to take it out and take them edited out and serve it to users in an interoperable way that supports a high quality of service. Um, and that principled stand worked incredibly quickly so that, you know, whereas in 2012 these distributors just refused to give us APIs, we now have high functioning APIs out of all the major public library ebook distributors. And I think the next phase of this work, one of the most important things we can do is build on that success and apply that same principle and approach to the rest of the library world so that we can extend some of the successes we've had focused primarily around public circulating libraries to also benefit academic and school libraries and special libraries as well. And I think that Readers First offers us a model um, and a vehicle, uh, in part, I think there are many organizations that can and should contribute to this, to continue to move that forward and give libraries the raw materials they need in order to own their service. And that really starts with interoperability. And so I think that's a, a critical underpinning of all of this work. Um, so with that, I'm going to start by, I mean, most of you know these projects, so I'm going to try to move through it quickly. Um, as you probably know, the grant uh, in 2012 that was awarded by the IMLS to create uh, the Library Simplified Project, now, now named Simply E as the product that came out of that, uh, has been, I think, um, you know, we've been working hard for three years. My colleague and partner in this, James English, who's the product owner for that, is also here and has built a beautiful, uh, simple uh, ebook reading experience, which has now been released. The first instance of that is the Open Ebooks app that Michelle mentioned. Um, and that is also now available to libraries to start using. And my hope is that this year we'll see many deployments across the library world and this will start to become very real. So that's ready uh, in the sense that the technology is up, it's working, it's proving to be very scalable in open ebooks impl implementation. Uh, and it is designed to be open source and as inexpensive as possible for libraries to deploy. And the first step in them beginning to take ownership of their relationship with their patrons. And I guess sort of philosophically, I'd like to emphasize that that's why we started here. Um, it is the, the app through which people read is the primary mechanism for discovery. It's the touch point where we interact with our patrons. And what we wanted to start with is the assertion that these patrons are our patrons, our customers, and our relationship. And our vendors uh, sometimes would like to both sell us content and own that relationship. And I think we have begun to reject that and say, you know, if a library chooses to provide these services through a vendor hosted offering, then that is fine if it's the library's choice. But that cannot be our only option. We as libraries have the right and the need to have the, uh, the interoperability that supports us in serving libraries in an environment we own and we control. And I think Simply E is the vehicle for that right now. So it allows us both to merge all of our ebook content from multiple distributors into one place so that we can rationalize it and put it all in one place, which in turn allows us to free our procurement decisions uh, of the user experience so that we can uh, buy from whomever gives us the best deal, whomever we want, and that will drive competition in the market. And I think that in some ways, even more exciting and powerful 
then what Simply E can do today is what it's going to be able to do tomorrow, which is that because we own it, we can do what we want with it. If libraries want to come together and say that it's really critical to be able to ingest an API feed about programs we're running in our branches so that we can have push marketing and there's a pop-up in your e-reader saying, you know, we're running a program in a branch five blocks from you in half an hour, please come join. That's something that we can fully build now because this is our experience and we own it. This is providing library service through library-owned channels, which I think is really the point uh, of all of this work. So, you know, briefly, specifically, Simply E right now, today, can integrate through middleware collections that libraries own and host on the three major existing library vendors, uh, 3M Biblioteca, Baker and Taylor, and Overdrive. Uh, the Biblioboards or Bibliolouds API is within weeks of being finished, and then, you know, that too, this year, will be able to be integrated. Um, and so we continue to have, um, you know, more and more content that we can roll into one better comprehensive experience. And I'd like to, to go back to Greg's slide about um, the other ebook platforms. I think we've really turned a corner in the last three years in that as I talk to other distributors, so EBSCO is a standout example of this. They were second on Greg's slide. Um, there are many state libraries, many consortia, and many individual libraries who own ebook collections through EBSCO. Now, EBSCO does not yet have a content API, so it would be impossible to merge their content into anything but their app. But in conversations with them in the last month, it's been clear to me that it, we're in a very different place. So in 2012, these distributors refused to build APIs, and we were trying to you know, beat and bludgeon and negotiate, and we still kind of failed. And then we started Readers First with others that had, had the same experience to demand access to our content. We're not there anymore. So if you talk to EBSCO, uh, they will tell you that they're perfectly open to building a content API. They plan to do it, and they're willing to build to our spec so that we can make these interoperable. And that is an example of this reader's first application that is the underpinning to be able to doing any of this work. So I think one of the most important thing that libraries are interested in this need to do is to start talking to their vendors and their providers about the importance of interoperability. And even if it's going to take your library another year or two or three, to roll out these platforms, you can help right now by underscoring with your budget uh, to your vendors the importance of interoperability philosophically, fundamentally, which will do nothing but open options for you as a library and for other libraries. And to Greg's survey and the point about the financial power of libraries, um, even just within the 20 partners named on the LEAP grant, there's 28 million in e-content spend. And so nationally, we know that this number is hundreds of millions. So it is a substantial market, um, and we are spending a lot of money. And so if we can speak with a unified voice about what we want, we can change that market. And we can start saying to our vendors that interoperability is table stakes. It's not an extra. It is what we require. When we buy content, it's ours, and we want the ability and the right to serve it in the best environment for our users and in an environment that lets us control that. So the, the next series in this project was LEAP, the Library Content Access Project, which you've all heard a lot about. This is basically the, the effort to go further and build a back end to the system that would be a library-owned uh, marketplace, a library-centric marketplace and distributor. So this is the whole right-hand side of the six-part stack at the bottom of this page. Um, I think this can be built and up, hopefully, in a pilot version this calendar year. So we're going to try to push very quickly. Again, you know, building on Christine's point, we're learning from what others have done that started before us, and so we're conceiving this right out of the gate as a national platform. Every library in the country will be free, and we will encourage them over time to enter and buy through this, through this marketplace. Um, we'll start with ebooks, but we'll quickly move to other things. We will continue to follow and pursue the Reader's First Principles of uh, a loosely coupled architecture that gives libraries options. I think this offers a clear win-win for publishers because to the degree you can save libraries money that would have otherwise gone to distributors, we will all reinvest that in content and publishers recognize that and I think are eager for a library-owned option in the marketplace. Um, and we want this to be as decentralized as possible. So we hope that as we work, and this is already very much starting, we will build close collaborations and that this, although being incubated right now at New York Public Library, I think we are already in deep partner relationships with a number of you. Um, in fact, uh, many of the successful programs on a regional basis, we're already in deep conversations about bringing them into formal governance roles and sharing with them in the incubation of LEAP. And that includes the Montana Library Association that Christine talked about, Khalifa, uh, and also the Denver Library that carry the Evo project forward. So I think I'm out of time. Um, so I guess I'll skip this and let you ask questions about it if you'd like. 
Um, but I do think there's a number of ways you can help. Um, and I think you're probably here because you have uh, questions or something to say about this. So we'd love to hear what that is and, um, and have a discussion about how we can all move ebooks forward in libraries. Thank you. Is this working? Nope. Can you hear me? OK. <laughs> Apparently, this has been on the entire time. So good thing I didn't say anything embarrassing. Um, so we only have about five minutes left in the session. Um, as Micah mentioned, you know, if any of you are coming to the uh, reception afterwards, you can find me or Micah or Rachel. Uh, we have several other colleagues who are here who can talk to um, Open eBooks or Leap in some capacity. We're happy to help connect you with them. Um, so we'll take a couple of questions with our time left. That's how good we did. <laughs> There's got to be a question out there. Or comments. Thank you. I guess if you know if there's really not a question, I've been wanting to ask one, which is, I mean, you've heard us making the case, and if anyone is feeling brave and wants to volunteer, uh, you know, I would be curious uh, of audience members what most excites you about the opportunity to own our ebook and our e-content delivery channels. You know, what do you see as the most powerful and compelling opportunities? Anyone feeling brave and want to step up and volunteer? What what gets you? Why why did you come to this talk? You know what what gets you excited about this? Yeah, thanks, Michael. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Is certainly very exciting. I think that. Libraries have learned in the last 10 years that branding is essential, and this is going to be an opportunity for us to do that. Uh, second thing is it has been too difficult for library users to get access to content, in many cases, ebook content. And if we can simplify that and provide a better model for the publishers to work with us, that we will see continuing exponential increases in library ebooks. And libraries are not ebooks only, it's e content. And this is yet another way to make ourselves more relevant and present in an increasingly digital world. I think that's exactly right. You know, we, we need to own this from every angle. If I'm not seeing other hands, I guess I'd love to build on that publisher point. I think many of us have talked about the need to evolve relationships with publishers. And I think, um, again, projects like Amigos and Khalifa have uh, broken tremendous ground there in showing that smaller publishers are willing to work directly, even with regional uh, library associations, and make their books available through those platforms. I think one of the goals of the LEAP project, which is completely supportive of that and hopefully you know, consistent with it, is to allow libraries all over the country and library organizations like Khalifa and Amigos to onboard that content to a national marketplace so that we can not only buy content in better terms, but we can help to bring those relationships uh, into existence so that we can offer a more diverse and a broader range of content. And then the second piece of that is about getting to better terms. And I think we have begun to show that that's also possible. Examples like open ebooks, where by presenting the library values based argument, we were able to get these incredible donations that are now making this content free to low income. But also, you know, other work of the ALA Digital Content Working Group and actually NYPL directly pushing with libraries. I think multiple voices from the library community have helped both to bring libraries back or publishers back into the library market in 2012 and can now go further in working directly with those publishers uh, to get us to better deals. And I think that's one of the important points about why we need to take ownership of this whole pipeline, this whole channel, because it's pretty clear to many of us, I think, that the commercial distributors from whom we buy books their incentives are just not well aligned. If we get a better price term, if we get a better term in terms of options, they don't make any more money. And that just, in fact, costs them money because now they have to go redo in their systems to accommodate that term. So you know, we need an advocate that is a sophisticated sort of uh, a business advocate to deal with publishers, especially the biggest publishers. And I think we can also benefit tremendously from a distributed capacity that allows libraries all over the country to be not only a provider of content, but a channel for making content discoverable and available in libraries by working directly with publishers and potentially in the future even authors in their region um, to bring that content into libraries um, and to make it discovered. Other questions or comments? 
It's 3.47 now. Okay, so, so we're technically two minutes past. Thank you to my colleagues for joining me on this panel. Thank you to you all for joining us today. Um, hopefully you can find some cookies out there because we got one more session. Maybe there's some <laughs> coffee. <laughs> but thank you all for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.